My name is Lisa Stromquist, and I'm the coordinator for quality and patient safety um, for the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. So welcome uh, this afternoon or uh, this morning to our friends out west to um, our webinar, How to Be Smart When Implementing Smart Pump Technology. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Shelley McKinney. She's uh, with uh, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, ISMP Canada, and uh, she'll be leading off the discussion today. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just so pleased that you're able to join us today for this presentation on uh, how to be smart when implementing smart uh, pump technology. And we have brought uh, to you uh, an expert in this area, uh, Michin Chen, is a neonatal intensive care a clinical pharmacist who practices at uh, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And Meacham um, has a lot of experience both uh, in the clinical practice setting and as well in um, supervising in, in one of her roles previously the sterile preparation area in the pharmacy and then really overseeing the development of the parenteral IV manual. And because of her extensive knowledge both in terms of the IV solutions and sort of how the pumps would be working and also, you know, contacts with the practitioners and the nurse, uh, nurses at the bedside was really one of her uh, key success strategies in terms of being able to um, successfully implement this project. So I think you're going to really enjoy all of the expertise that uh, Meachin brings. I'll just get Meachin to change the slide. So the presentation today is really uh, part of a collaboration between both uh, CAFC and also uh, ISMP, the Institute of Safe Medication Practice. And uh, the uh, first partner is um, CAFC, which is the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And as you can see, there's over 45 member institutions, uh, and it's uh, representing a multidisciplinary healthcare professionals, really uh, focusing on safety for children, youth, and all of their families across all of the variety of healthcare settings that uh, patients would be um, treated and seen. And the vision is that they be a recognized leader and advocate for advancing improvement of healthcare for Canadians, uh, children, and youth. Next slide. So if you are uh, wanting more details, then certainly you can find the CAFC website there. We've got it on the slide, and as well, there are Twitters, uh, and you can get your tweets, and also you can check on Facebook. The second uh, organization that's in the partnership is uh, the Institute of Safe Medication Practice Canada, and this is a not-for-profit organization really uh, focusing and dedicated to preventing preventable harm from medications and with an, aware, uh, an aim to heighten awareness and system vulnerabilities and looking at how to improve the system across the continuum of care. The uh, Canadian Medication Incident Reporting System and Prevention Sur uh, System, and that's uh, lovingly called uh, CMERC, that is a partnership with um, Health Canada and the Canadian Institute of Health information and supported also with Canadian Patient Safety Institute. And this, um, as uh, ISMP has worked quite some time in terms of voluntary reporting, and now with this new CMERPS program, it includes uh, voluntary reporting not only for healthcare professionals, but as well uh, the public. And if we just uh, click on the next slide, uh, you can see the, um, the websites there, and you can actually access these links from ISMP website as well. So it's really that voluntary reporting and quite uh, novel and innovative having the consumer as well helps with awareness, and those are the opportunities to really uh, gather data and determine you know, what strategies can be implemented to make improvements. As well, ISMP um, has a Facebook page and then uh, Twitter, so you can sign up to uh, be aware of some of the news and uh, uh, different uh, strategies as things are moving forward. So in terms of today's presentation, this really comes out of um, a number of years of work and uh, focus on um, pediatric opioid safety. And in terms of the background, in October 2006, there was uh, one of the safety uh, symposiums that CAFC had. It really was identified at that point in time that needed to create some system standards for high-risk 
education for pediatric settings was identified as a priority. Prior to that, there's been a lot of work in the adult population, but because of the unique um, setting and in terms of some unique uh, parameters with this group, really needs to be focused. So over the next, um, in 2008, the next year, there was uh, a focus in the phase one of really looking at the data, and as we mentioned before about the medication incidence and the reporting, which is voluntary, how important that is to be able to have that rich data and then to mine through and go through and really be able to identify what were the trends. So when they looked at the top five medications that were causing harm or had the potential in pediatric patients through the database, it was uh, came to their attention that opioids were identified several times. And so that was the decision to focus on that particular uh, group. So in phase two, January uh, 2009 to 2010, through consultation and some focus groups from different uh, member hospitals and individuals, and also involving human factors expertise, the draft guidelines they were created, and those actually are currently available on the CAPSI website. So today we are actually in phase three, and this is really the knowledge translation where we have the consensus guidelines, we're moving forward providing education, and then also implementing these guidelines in a variety of practice settings. So there are two sets of guidelines, one for community hospitals and those with tertiary pediatric hospitals with a little bit more um, higher level of acuity of uh, pediatric patients. Those are on the website as I mentioned and, and as well there's an excellent um, pediatric safety resource kit and that has some of your references and a number of tools and strategies that really are um, excellent in terms of moving forward to uh, adopt the guidelines. In terms of education sessions, today is just one of the educational sessions that's being offered, and we're really focusing on smart pump implementation, which is one of the recommendations. So today's learning objective um, is that uh, by the end of the session that you would understand both the benefits and safety features of smart pump technology. In addition, that you would be able to prepare for the implementation and understand what uh, was required with regards to standard concentrations, creation of the drug libraries, and all of the required supports in place. And then as well, because of the uh, successful implementation at CHEO, that you would really understand some of those key strategies with education and ongoing uh, data monitoring and making the changes as there's required. So I will now turn it over to Nichen, and uh, she will present um, all of her, uh, her journey as she implemented this technology. Hi everyone, thanks so much. Um, we all know that medication mistakes injure 1.5 million patients each year and hospitalized patients are at risk for at least one medication error per patient day. Um, errors can originate in anywhere in the medication use process, but you can see here that administration of medications um, 38% of errors originate in the administration of medications, and 51% of medication errors that result in patient harm are due to administration. Infusion pumps um, administer IV medication, and high alert medications are more likely to cause patient harm, and that's because of the immediate onset of action from the IV route compared to the oral route, and the fact that many high alert medications are given IV. There was a study done in the UK that showed that preparation and administration of IV medication, um, they found a 49% error rate. And with IV boluses, they found that 70% of the time it was given too quickly. And then you can have errors from incorrect programming. For example, programming morphine 10 mils an hour instead of morphine 1 mil an hour. So because of all these reasons, ISMP recommends using smart pumps. And one of the consensus guidelines for smart pumps is that we adopt standard concentrations of opioids. And you can see here the suggestion from all these consensus guidelines uh, for the concentration of morphine, hydromorph, fentanyl. And we want to differentiate be, um, among the opioids so that we don't have tenfold errors and so that we don't get confused. For example, so we don't mix up morphine with hydromorphone, you see that the concentrations are very different. And you see that community hospitals, the suggestion is just to try to limit to morphine only. 
If you have any questions about this, please refer to ISMP. So what are some of the benefits of smart pumps? Smart pumps, they allow an institution to develop libraries with institution-specific limits on like dose, time. You can have limits on rate limits. Um, it allows you to use uh, BSA for chemotherapy infusions. You can have limits on continuous infusions, bolus, intermittent infusions. Now, the pump, uh, smart pumps aren't perfect. Um, you could always bypass the drug library. And a software cannot replace independent double check. And so you'd probably still want to have a policy in your hospital uh, to require independent double check. Soft alerts can easily be overridden. And hard stops that aren't set up appropriately can be frustrating for the nurse, and then it'll lead to workarounds. And then data collection. If you don't have a wireless network, uh, manually updating and collecting data can be very time consuming. So at CHEO, we're a 167-bed tertiary care hospital located in Ottawa. We have 6,000 6, missions a year. And you see we have a neonatal intensive care unit, pediatric intensive care unit, surgery, general pediatrics, hematology, oncology. There's emergency and then a medical day unit. So in 2010, uh, we implemented our syringe pump with DARES across all of our units for all of our continuous infusions. And we also use it for all of our intermittent infusions if the volume is less than 60 mils. And this took one year. And then in 2011, we implemented large volume pumps with DARES across all of our units. And it's used for all of our IV fluids, large volume continuous infusions, and intermittent infusions if the volume is greater than 60 mils. Now this also took a year. Uh, we did a two-step implementation because we had two different vendors. And we felt this worked best for our institution. But obviously, if you had one vendor, you could go live with everything at once. So you have to be careful when you're preparing. There's a lot of work to prepare for implementation, because changing from traditional IV infusion pumps to smart infusion pumps is more than simply replacing the pump. It requires a coordinated effort with all of the stakeholders involved throughout the medication process. And some of your st stakeholders, pharmacy, nursing, physicians, IT, biomedical. So as an institution, you will have to decide for yourself um, what are the safety checks. You know, when you build the library, who's going to check that, how that's going to be built, what you're going to include in the new technology. Are you going to include um, barcodes, CPOE, EMAR? For sure, you'll include standard drug concentration, and you'll have to decide what type of pump to go with. S significant time must be allocated for developing, maintaining, and updating drug libraries. Um, we had already worked on a lot of things before we actually started building the drug library, and I'll explain that later on. But just to build the library, it took me six months for each pump. And then also, there's always going to be something that comes up that you don't know about until you actually start working on the pump. So you need time to work on everything else that's involved with pump implementation, making sure that everyone knows about these new practice changes, updating resources. I would also suggest that you also have dedicated nursing time. So I worked on the library for six months, and I had a nurse who was dedicated to the project as well with me for that same time period. And the nurse needs time to educate other nurses on practice changes, how to administer medication. She needs time to work out practice issues like flush. We had to figure that out for both of our pumps. And then also time for development of policies and procedures. So you have to develop policies as well in your institution. Um, when we're going to use the, what the expectation is of using the safety software ideally in all situations, and the consequences for not using the safety software. You have to determine processes for changes to drug libraries. And you have to create policy that uses independent check for select high alert medications. So at CHEO, we actually do have a policy for both of our pumps about using it. And we make sure we use it all the time. And what are the consequences of overriding soft limit? What happens if you hit a hard limit? And we also have an independent check policy for our high alert medications. 
Standardized drug concentration, it's absolutely crucial that you have standardized drug concentration before you go live with, with any pump with DERS. And it's critical to reduce unnecessary variability as it increases the opportunity for error. It can take a long time to establish standardized drug concentration, and my suggestion is that institutions work on this a year before you build the DERS library. You have to get physician buy-in, you might have to work on your pre-printed orders, you might have changed a lot of things in pharmacy, etc. And so we do have standardized drug concentrations, and every drug in the syringe pump library has a standard drug concentration. Now, we've had standardized drug concentrations for all of our continuous infusions since 2006. And before building the libraries, I converted our SIVA program over to standard drug concentration. So by the time I built our library, we probably had SDC for about 90% of our drugs. And then I just had to work on establishing SDC for the remaining 10% of the medications on the pump before we actually went live. Um, you should try and limit the number of concentrations. So what we did is that if it's an intermittent drug, we just have one concentration for the NICU and one concentration for the rest of the hospital. NICU tends to be a more isolated unit. You don't really get transfers that much in and out of the NICU, so we felt that was fine. But there's a lot of um, transfers between the rest of the units of the hospital, so those ones are all the same concentration. And continuous fusions, as much as possible, what I did is I standardized the concentrations between the NICU and PICU. And you should try and maximize the use of commercially available products. I definitely found that was a lot easier when we got our new pumps, because the new pumps can run two decimal place rates, whereas our previous pumps could not. And they can run rates as low as 0.01 mil an hour. So that helped because then we could use commercially available products as much as possible and we could have less concentrations. Now how we gave meds before we actually went live with the pumps is that we were still using a Buretrol. And the medication would be sent up from pharmacy in a standard drug concentration, but it would not necessarily be administered that way since the medication could be mixed with 20 mils of fluid in the Buretrol. And so it was given not necessarily in a standard drug concentration. So we had to do a lot of education. And the nurse educators spent a lot of time ensuring that the nurses understood how to use the parental manual, you know, how a drug needs to be reconstituted, how it needs to be prepared to that standard drug concentration, and the importance of preparing it to that standard drug concentration. Um, and I spent a lot of time updating our parental manual, which I'll show you later to reflect all these um, standard drug concentration changes. And we worked on this practice change and education months before we actually went live. So building your drug library, um, there are studies that show that soft limits really had no significant effect on preventing errors, because it's very easy just to override a soft limit, usually with just one keystroke. Hard limits, though, are shown to prevent dosing errors and thereby increase patient safety. So I went with hard limits for all of my drugs in my pump. For intermittent infusion, every drug has the usual milligram per kilo per dose, plus or minus 10%. That is a hard limit, hard upper limit, and a hard lower limit. And I went with 10% to allow for rounding of doses. Continuous infusion. It's the dose as in references, built as hard limits. You don't necessarily need a buffer for continuous infusions, because if the limit's 10 mics per kilo per minute, the pump can allow 10 mic per kilo per minute to be programmed. So I spent a lot of time. So I made sure that every drug has a hard limit, but at the same time, I spent a lot of time validating my drug library to make sure that the hard limits would not be frustrating for the nurse. So for PEDS, you, there's you know all different patient populations, all different weights. So you have to make sure that your library is going to work for neonates, it's going to work for pediatrics, and it's going to work for adolescents, which is like adult dosing. Um, you also have to take into account your different care areas and the library specific to those care areas. And one of those examples is like morphine continuous infusion. You can see that in NICU. We have a lower dosing range from 0.25 to 100 mics per kilo per hour, but the PICU uses a higher, much higher range from 2 to 400 mics per kilo per hour. 
Um, I also s separated the dose based on indication if I felt it was clinically relevant, like gentamicin once daily versus traditional dose, and vasopressin shock versus for GI bleed for diabetes insipidus. And then what I was explaining before, make sure you have clinical care specific drug library, like you'll need more anesthesia, NICU, PICU, GENPs, et cetera. So you can see with all these details that it takes a long time to build a library, and that's why I suggest um, you need six months. And I really feel, too, um, the pharmacist owns the drug library build piece along with the nurse, but it's really the pharmacist that's building the drug library. And I would suggest that the pharmacy lead be someone who understands your institution practices very well and someone who understands how medications are administered. And for me, like I, I wrote the parental manual. I was, I'm in charge of the SIVA program. And I felt that helped me a lot with the pump implementation because then I can make changes to the parental manual, I can make changes to SIVA, and it gave me a good understanding of how we administer medications here, IV medications. So validating the library. So validating, of course, is important so that you make sure your end users are not frustrated with the parameters that are set in the library. So I built that initial library, and then it was double-checked by a second pharmacist. Then what I did is I took that library to a clinical practice expert from each inpatient unit, so eMERGE, PICU, NICU, hematology, oncology, general pediatrics, and anesthesia as well. Well, and the clinical practice expert and pharmacist responsible for the drug library, what we, we sat down and what we did is we went through each and every drug and I worked out little scenarios for each drug and we would go through each and every drug and program it to make sure it worked. And we'd make sure that, um, you know, the concentration was correct and the dosing units were correct and the infusion time, all of those things were verified. And if needed, I would make changes to the drug library after these validation sessions. In addition to those uh, sessions with the nursing, what I did is I took six months of physician orders, and I went through each and every order the physician wrote, and I did real life um, validation of the syringe pump library. And as well, I reviewed all the preprinted orders to make sure that all the parameters in the pump would work with the physician orders. And I actually still continue to review physician orders after go live to maintain the drug library. And you have to make sure, of course, that your units, your dose uh, match physician orders, your preprinted orders, your pharmacy labels, your MAR, and CPUE. So this is kind of what I was talking about. You have to make sure you address the needs of special areas like pediatrics, NICU. Um, there aren't that many standard drug concentrations available for pediatrics, so you might find in pharmacy that you do have to prepare more of these standard drug concentrations. And weight and age, age ranges are wider, so there's a lot more parameters you have to build into your drug library. And then make sure you get anesthesiologists involved in your drug library. Access to multiple drug libraries. Um, you might want to give your users access to different um, clinical care libraries. So in our institution, anesthesia is the only library that's protected. Only anesthesia can access that, or everyone else can access everyone else's drug library. For example, if you're NICU, if you want to access something in PICU, you could. So prior to implementation, you're going to want to make sure that um, everyone's educated, and you probably want to plan about six to 12 weeks of ongoing staff education, and you want to educate all your nursing staff close to the implementation date. You'll also want to include pump training and orientation, and you'll have to make sure your policies and procedures are in place, and we'll all have to explain the benefits of technology, which is increased patient safety. Now, my suggestion is that you make sure that your staff are trained on institute-specific issues before you go live. For example, how are you going to flush? You know, a big change for us was standard drug concentration, so we worked on that. How are you going to access your references? Um, I did not find that there was time to cover these institute-specific issues during pump training with a vendor, so I definitely suggest you, you go through this ahead of time. 
And there's always things that you're going to discover only when you start building the pump. And so you have to make sure everyone knows about these uh, institute-specific issues. So just to explain some of the tools that I worked on and some of the uh, to help nursing with this practice change. So we have this parental manual, and every medication administered parentally has a monograph. And every monograph contains directions on reconstitution, compatibility information, the standard drug concentration, infusion time dosage, and every monograph is written by a geopharmacist and it's adapted to our institution's practices. We also have a neonatal manual, which has all the dosage and dilution guidelines specific to the NICU. So here's an example of a monograph here. Do you see sevazolin? And I tell the nurse how, what, how it needs to be reconstituted. I might not necessarily use the manufacturer's instructions. And as much as possible, I would always try to reconstitute it directly to the standard drug concentration, if that's possible. So you see here the final concentration is 100 milligrams per mil. And in the next slide, it tells the nurse, OK, well, when you administer the medication, the standard concentration is 100 milligrams per mil and what the infusion time is. And I try to keep it the same. Um, I try to limit all my concentrations to one. So we are we're going to be 24-7, but we were not a 24-7 pharmacy by the time we went live with a syringe pump. And a lot of our nurses had um, issues with reconstituting meds, uh, well, not reconstituting meds, but diluting meds to standard drug concentration. And it's difficult for pediatrics because every dose is different. So what I did is I made this Excel program. And what it allows the nurse to do is she chooses the drug. She will then input the patient's dose. And then the program will then instruct the nurse on how to dilute to that standard drug concentration. And the nurse, every nurse loves this program. So I'll show you what it is. This is an example of what it is. So you can see at the top here, the concentration you're going to end up with is morphine 1 milligram per mil. So I input in my patient's dose 10 milligrams of morphine, and it tells me I need 5 mils of morphine 2 milligram per mil, and 5 mils of diluent, and my final volume 10 mils. When you're rolling out, you'll have to decide for yourselves what you think works best, um, what's the sequence of patient care areas, consider the size and the type of unit, and just make sure there's adequate staff and resources. And we should have continuous rounding of super users and feedback during the rollout. So monitoring. So we have a wireless infrastructure now in order to do um, monitoring. And I definitely suggest that you get wireless network. Uh, before we had our wireless network, I would say it was a real hassle to go retrieve each and every pump to download the information. And so then the downloading of information, upload of a new library was very sporadic. Now that it's wireless, I'm able to download this information once a week. And then I do the assessment and investigation of that pump data. If I discover any issues, I discuss that with the clinical educator for that unit. And then I'll determine whether an update needs to be made to the library based on that information. Here's an example of some of our data. We want to have here at CHEO a 95% compliance with the drug library. And if the compliance drops below 95%, then I'll investigate causes like, for example, does a new drug need to be added, or do I need to change some parameters? And we're always doing education on the importance of using the drug library for patient safety. So this is an example of our data from January to November of last year. And you can see we had a compliance rate of 95.59%. And only 4.4% of our infusions were outside the library. And of all the infusions that we give inside the library, only 6% of the time do we have um, issues with safety events. So that means, you know, like a hard limit or a soft limit was hit, something like that. And I would say that most of the limits that we have are not true limit issues. The most common programming issues I see are a drug selection error, like gentamicin once daily versus traditional. Or sometimes what we do is we enter the patient's weight into the dose field. And before, when we gave IVs, we were used to programming volume. So we're just inputting volume instead of putting milligrams into the dose field. 
These are some of the reports that I look at. Depending on the pumps that you get, it'll be different. But it used to take me probably about half a day to look at this, and now it just takes me a couple hours. And if a drug library change is needed, a request is sent to me myself, and then I consult with nursing to review the drug library changes. Those changes are double-checked by another pharmacist. And then we'll determine whether it has to be done right away or can wait for quarterly updates. And then a package is sent to the business systems analyst and then and biomed. A message is sent to nursing and biomed deploys the library to the pump and then monitors the update. And that's it. There's some contacts. If you want to contact me, I'm at the bottom. And and there are references. And then any questions? Thank you, Meechan. I have, uh, so far I just have uh, one question uh, in the queue. Um, well, there's been a, a few questions about the availability of the presentation. So this presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network uh, for people to view um, you know, when they have time or to share with other uh, colleagues. And uh, we'll also put up the uh, PowerPoint slides so you'll have access to both. Uh, and we'll send out a notice as soon as the, uh, usually takes a couple of days before we get uh, the actual recording posted, but uh, probably by Monday or Tuesday it'll be up, but the uh, slides will be up uh, this afternoon. So we're getting a few more questions in. Uh, one of the questions, uh, the first question was actually more about our consensus, more about the consensus guidelines. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer that on the call today, but it is, why is hydromorphone units in micrograms instead of milligrams? Use of micrograms is confusing to staff who are used to milligrams, and it also removes the clue that this is a potent drug when staff see 250 micrograms instead of 0.25 milligrams. So I think um, just because we had cut just a small piece out of the guideline. Uh, we didn't uh, have the, the, the complete uh, guideline in there. But um, I think Shelley, maybe um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what we really want is if you put it as micrograms or milligrams, it just needs to be consistent throughout the whole process. So you could actually choose you know, an organization if you want to, to refer to it as milligrams or micrograms, as long as you have it, you know, from your pump back to your uh, pre-printed orders, uh, everything consistent, I think, is really what, um, what the guideline um, uh, recommends. So does that, does that sound right to you, Shelley? Uh, yes, that sounds right. And so I have some other uh, questions here for you, Meechan. So uh, from Jen, what is your policy around non-use of the library? So what we encourage is 100% compliance with the library. Um, if a soft limit is breached and they, the nurse would like to override that soft limit, she actually needs to get an okay from the physician. Now if a hard limit is reached, um, again, you'd have to actually consult the physician and tell them, you know, a hard limit is reached, are you sure this is, this is what you want? Um, and then I think we haven't figured out quite the details of what we're going to do about that. Like if you have a hard limit and the physician still wants to give that medication. But then the nurse does run outside the library and then we just try and like follow up, find out, okay, well, is it an issue of like a new drug needs to be added? Do we have to adjust our parameters? We do some problem solving. Sometimes what I find um, happens is, again, going back to that um, issue where you have to make sure you have, in some ways this is institute specific training, but it also has to do with the pump. For example, this, this pump that we have, it will not allow a rate less than 0.1 mil an hour unless the syringe size is 3 mils. So sometimes you just have to do education, make sure people realize that we, the pump will not let you program that dose unless that syringe size is 3 mils. I don't know. I hope I hope that answers the question. Okay. 
Um, and oh, actually, I have a question here. Is there an email contact for a nurse educator? So um, I. Uh, we might be able to supply that after I meet him. We might be able to, uh, for more yeah. information, if there's somebody at uh, CHEO. For sure. I'll ask her if it's okay if I give her her email. Yeah. And then I okay. can uh, send it to you, and then we yeah. can post it. Perfect. Thanks so much. And uh, let's see. From Greg, we have, what references do you use when deciding on a standard concentration for an intermittent medication? So I looked at, um, mostly I looked at Lexi, LexiComp, and there's another book, I'm sorry, I call it the Teddy Bear book, but everyone in pediatrics probably knows what I'm talking about when I say Teddy Bear. I looked at those two the most. And then what I, so from that, what I try to do as much as possible, if I could, is I try to reconstitute the drug directly to that standard drug concentration. So looking at the vial size and stability, um, so a lot of my intermittent drugs, just based on the fact, like for example, the cefazolin, you can give it 100 milligrams per mil. It's fine. It won't damage the veins at that concentration. And then looking at the vial size and how much I could reconstitute it with, it, it only fits, most likely would only fit 100 milligrams per mil, so I couldn't make it 50 milligrams per mil. So a lot of mine is the extrapolation of looking at Lexi, looking at the teddy bear book, looking at the vial size, stability, and, um, and then looking at your patient weight and determining what volume would accommodate most doses. So for example, that's the Fazlin, 100 milligram per mil, it's, it's good stability, um, it's fine for the vein, so it's not going to damage the vein. Most doses would not exceed 2,000 milligrams, so that'd be 20 mils, so that's nice and fits in the, in the syringe pump. And even for our little babies, it may be with the smallest volume would be maybe 1.8 mils, which is okay because our priming and our tubing is half a mil. Okay, so I have a, another question from Elizabeth. Is smart pump usage dependent on electronic prescribing? We don't have electronic prescribing here. So and it, it, it works fine for us, but Okay. All right. And from Maureen we have what amount of dedicated time to the IV pump issues does a pharmacist get? Is there any dedicated nursing time post implementation? We had some um, dedicated nursing time post implementation, like um, probably for a month after we went live. You know, we had a lot more super users, and we made sure all the clinical educators were around. But after that one month period, I would say that the nurse does not have dedicated nursing time to deal with pump issues. And has that been a problem? Um, I find it's just absorbed um, with our, into the clinical educator's time. No, I haven't, I haven't found too many issues. If there's, a, if there's a pump issue identified, then the educator just incorporates it into her teaching time and just make sure everyone on that unit is aware of the issue. Okay, so from uh, Nellie, we have, what if you have a drug that needs administration that is not in the library, say on night shift where no pharmacy is available? So I'm guessing that the drug is not available in the library? That's what, yeah, that's I think what she's saying. We you have a drug that, yeah, that is not in the library. Or uh, so, well, mostly for us what happens is that um, it's usually an oncology medication, and the pre we know about the new medication because we're working on the preprinted order months in advance. So what I'll try and do is anticipate those types of situations and put those drugs in the library if we know we're getting a new drug. But if it happens that, you know, on the weekend we had to get a new drug in and it didn't live in the pump, then the nurse would go outside the library for that. Okay, actually, um, Nellie, I can unmute you if you have any other um, okay. comments on that. Where do I do that? So do I I've unmuted you, Nellie, so I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hello. No, I think I think we're okay. That that was basically our question. That okay. you know, every now and then on weekends or on nights, we get um, 
some really weird drugs that for some reason need to be started on that shift? And does the pump allow you to input information outside of the drug library? Yes, it does. Okay. And this is Nastra, and I'm working at Sinai now, so I'm going to email you after, but I just want to say hello. Hey, Nastra. How are you? <laughs> Good, you? Good job. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mute your line again. So. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And let me see. Um, Jen, do you have, if, I mean, I'll try to unmute you as well, but um, do you require double checks for dilution? activities to standard concentration? That's a good question. Um, did you, um, I know you're on, uh, if you have a microphone on your computer, you should be able to uh, talk to Hi us. Hi there. Yeah, uh, we can hear you. So yeah, I was yeah. wondering yeah. specifically for all medications or certain medications or none? Um, if it's just reconstitution, I can't think of any high alert medications that require reconstitution. So if it's just reconstitution, no, we don't require a double check. But if it's high alert, then yes, we require a double check on all, like the reconstitution, um, dilution, and any in settings on the pump. Okay. Well, Hi, Shelley. Would you be able to give examples of um, how many drugs you would have as high alert in your organization? Oh. Um, it's basically, <laughs> our original policy basically encompassed everything except for probably antibiotics. But right now what we're focusing is on pinch, so potassium, insulin, narcotics, chemo, and what's H? I forget. Ever? Heparin, thank you. <laughs> so that's what we're focusing on right now, even though our original policy encompasses every drug basically except for antibiotics. Great, thank you, Mitchum. Yeah. True. Um, Maureen, I'm going to unmute you as well. So, and her question is, do you have any limits for TPN and lipids? Do you have a problem with switching these lines? I do have limits for my TPN and for my lipids, and then depending on the, like in the NICU, you know, the most I figured we would ever have in neonates, if that's possible, is 10 kilos. So my TPN limits are based on 10 kilos, and then outside of the war, outside of neonates, I have different limits for TPN and lipids for like general pediatrics and PICU, but yes, I've had limits and um, haven't come across any issues with that yet. So, Maureen, I don't know if um, if you have a microphone, but if you do, if you have any other comments. Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. So, uh, and Shauna, we'll try to unmute you as well. Is there a policy around stability of syringes prepared by RNs on the ward? So our nurses, um, you know, typically what they would do is they would just pr uh, prepare one dose and that one dose would be given to the patient and they don't keep any, any remainder. The vial that a nurse reconstitutes as well gets discarded after she's prepared that vial. Did you have any other questions or comments, uh, Shauna? And Jen, back to you. How do you manage non-preprinted orders that don't comply with set standards? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. Okay. It's really a matter of the physician uh, specifying the uh, strength. Is that maybe what the question is related to? Yeah. Or if they wrote an order in, in units that weren't consistent with um, what you have set up in the in the pump in the library? Okay, so like let's let's say an example of that is um, insulin. Insulin. Let's say the doctor wrote eight units an hour. I wouldn't be able to accept that order because the pump needs to have it programmed as units per kilo per hour. What we actually do is we actually write a pharmacist clarification that eight units per hour. Let's say the kid's 80 kilos is equal to 0 0.1 units per kilo per hour. So the nurse knows to program it as units per kilo per hour. Have you had a big increase in the number of preprinted orders you've developed since the implementation of your smart pumps? 
Definitely. I think we used to have maybe 50. I think we're up to 250 right now. Wow. Mm. But a lot of the times, though, when the physician orders a drug, they don't necessarily include the concentration. So I haven't had any issues with that. It's just more about the dosing unit. Yeah. 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 And maybe just a comment with your pre-printed orders. Part of that number might be helping you with preparation of CPOE as well. Would that be true, Meacham? Exactly. Exactly. OK. So I have a um, uh, follow-up. Uh, from Maureen about the, the TPN and, and limits for the limits. So she's just uh, asking, she said, are these rate limits or dosing limits? So, lip, so lipid, for example, for us, we would never use more than 3 grams per kilo per day. And then our standard lipid concentration is 20%. So based on 3 grams per kilo per day and the lipid of 20%, I figured out what the mills per kilo per hour would be, and that's what my rate limit is for is for uh, lipid. For TPN, um, it's a rate limit. So in neonates, we would never use more than 100 mils an hour. So that's in neonates, and then everywhere else, it's a rate limit. Okay, great. So uh, I have another question uh, from Donna, and she's asking, are your oncology chemotherapeutic meds given on a large volume or syringe pump? They're currently given on a large volume pump. Okay. And from Shauna again, did you program your syringe pump default infusion time minimum as the IV bolus time? Example, some meds, three minutes. So it depends on the ward, actually. So if it's a PICU or eMERGE, the minimum time is the bolus time. Um, but if it's general pediatrics, NICU, then, or hematology, oncology, Sorry, there's just an overhead announcement. Um, then the min the minimum time is actually the lowest time of the intermittent infusion. Okay, is that good, Shauna? Maybe just a follow-up question to that, Nietzsche. Um, are your pumps dedicated to a particular patient care area, or are they transported along with the patient? They're transported along with the patient. So then they would have to, like instead of going from PICU to gen pediatrics, they would have to just change the profile from gen peds to okay, great, thank uh, you. general pediatrics. And then I also, for my infusion time, I always put it, the lower limit is always a hard limit. We can't give things quicker, but I never put a limit on um, how slow they can run infusion. So the high time, there's never a limit on that. They can always give things as long as they want. They just can't give things faster. Okay, I'll oh, hear. Can you tell me how many extra syringe pumps you required as a result of this change? Hmm. Well, we didn't have syringe pumps at first. We only had syringe pumps in our NICU and our PICU. Nobody else uses used syringe pumps before we actually went live with this one, the Hunt Dares. But for our hospital, I believe we purchased 280 syringe pumps. And that's a 167-bed hospital, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you could have a PICU patient, and they're using like 12 syringe pumps at a time. Uh, and there's also a question, what syringe pump, uh, the manufacturer, which uh, manufacturer are you using? Should I answer that? <laughs> well, it's, it, I think <laughs> it's okay to answer it. I think you, you're saying this is what... You, your organization decided to buy. It's not. It's worked for you. It's not. To, you're not saying to everybody that this is the one that they have to rush out and buy. So we have a uh, Smith Medical Medfusion 4000. So there, I mean, there's many. There's many different manufacturers out there. Oh, actually, I don't know how many manufacturers, but there are 
there are a number of different ones. So. Mm. The I four that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. And that each institution, you know, with the procurement guidelines has to go through, um, you know, the procurement process and the RFP and the tendering. So there's a whole, you know, process there that's laid out and your multidisciplinary team is all part of the decision making. We didn't really focus uh, so much today on that, that piece. Yeah. And another question, are both large and syringe pumps wireless? Yes, they are. And just got a message back from Shauna that they've already bought their uh, their pumps, so you're not influencing them at all. <laughs> Don't worry. All right. So right now, I don't know if there's anybody has any more questions, or um, Shelley, if you have uh, some more questions. So I, I think you know what that was great discussion after the presentation, and just really want to thank everyone for their participation. And uh, if you think of something after the presentation, then certainly um, email Lisa's uh, number and we can uh, get back to you with an answer, you know, afterwards. And I think somebody had asked about uh, the contact with the nurse educator from CHEO, so we will follow up on that. But uh, yeah, certainly if you think of something else, you have uh, the email addresses there. I think it's a good timely presentation as people are in the process of implementing the new technology. Alrighty, and again, uh, this presentation will be posted on the CAPC Knowledge Exchange Network, and uh, you can see actually all of our presentations are, are up there, and uh, you can get a link to them, uh, I think, through iTunes and, and uh, YouTube as well. So uh, we're up everywhere. So thank you, everybody, and we've got another big thank you for sharing the experience at CHEO. So um, I think everybody appreciated today's presentation. Thanks, Meechan. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.